So we saw on the previous lecture um, an example of clustering using prototypes. K-mean is a, a prototype-based clustering because each centroid is a prototype that represents all the clusters. Uh, now we're going to look at some problems with the prototype clustering. Uh, we're going to see affinity propagation, which is also a prototype based, but solves one of the problems of k-means, which is the need to specify how many clusters we want from the beginning. Uh, but then we're going to go beyond prototypes into density-based clustering, where we do not use uh, prototypes to represent all the clusters. And we're going to talk a bit also how we can validate a clustering. Cluster validation is, is a, a very complex uh, subject and also very dependent on the data and, and on knowledge about the data. So we're going only to talk a bit about it. You're going to do uh, some of it uh, during the second assignment, but we're not going to focus too much on, on that part, although it's, it's very important for, for any particular work. So let's see uh, one problem with, with prototypes. Prototype-based clustering uh, is essentially where we choose one uh, point, which can belong to our data point or, or not, but when we choose a point to be a prototype for the cluster and which uh, determines uh, what the cluster is like. So k-means is an example of prototype-based clustering where the prototypes are those uh, centroids. Uh, this is good for globular clusters if they have a similar disper dispersion, if we can specify how many clusters there are correctly. So if we use k-means with k equals 3 for this uh, data set, then it works fine. If we use, for example, k equals to 2, then it doesn't make much sense. So this is one problem with some algorithms uh, using prototype clustering, which is uh, specifying the k value. But we need to, uh, to uh, have some way of choosing the, the right k value. It's also not good if the clusters are not global, because uh, since we have uh, this prototype defining the cluster by proximity to the prototype, if the clusters are not globular, we still have globes here around the prototype, and we cannot fit the, the actual clusters that we have in our data set. Also, because we are choosing to assign each point to a prototype depending on which prototype is closest, so each centroid in the case of k-means, we have a hard time uh, solving uh, this problem of having different variances in different clusters. So this cluster uh, here is a lot more spread out. This is a very tight cluster. But if we put one centroid here and one centroid here, then in k-means using this distance uh, measure, the, <coughs> the frontier between the two clusters will fall here, which is not a natural point for separating these two clusters. So we have some problems here about uh, defining the number of, uh, of uh, prototypes, about the, the dispersion, uh, different uh, variances in different uh, clusters, because we are assigning points to the closest prototype, and uh, uh, this may be a problem for k-means. On the other hand, it may be an advantage. So for some particular applications, like we saw in vector quantization, these are actually the attributes we need. We need uh, to be able to specify how many centroids we have. We need to be able to split these uh, high-density regions into different blocks because we want to quantize uh, these values. So uh, these properties of k-means can be uh, a disadvantage in some cases, but they can be used uh, for some purpose in other situations. Uh, so k-means and k-medoids have the same, uh, have a fixed number of prototypes and also use this distance measure for the prototypes so they split the, the clusters at some midpoint between the prototypes. This can be useful in some applications, it can be uh, bad in other cases. So let's see uh, one example of a, a prototype-based algorithm that solves two of these problems. We don't need to, uh, to be so uh, the, the distance itself is not the only factor for assigning each point to the prototype, and also we do not need to specify explicitly how many prototypes we have at the start. So affinity propagation, you can imagine it as the result of our data points passing messages to each other, uh, saying how much they would like the other data point to represent them as the prototype, and telling the other data points if they are available for representing them or not. 
So we have these two uh, matrices here, which are the responsibility uh, sent by one point to another, uh, which tells uh, the other point how much the first point would like it to, to represent him, and the availability which, uh, the, which measures how much one point is available or is adequate as a representative for a group of points. So maybe you can imagine this as some kind of, of election where each person casts uh, votes, and then on the other side you see what the effects of these votes are because some candidates have more votes than others. And this is all based on a similarity matrix where you can uh, indicate how similar uh, points are to each other. This does not have to be uh, an actual distance. We don't need to compute uh, averages or something like that. What we need is only uh, a measure of similarity. And in the diagonal, the, the self-similarity, the similarity to oneself, we can put a, a large negative value that uh, is the uh, measures the reluctance or the, 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 the propensity for a point to be a prototype. The, the more negative that value will be, the more resistant the points will be to becoming prototypes and the lower the number of clusters you tend to have. So the way this algorithm works is that we start with responsibility and availability at zero. These would be negative matrices. They tend to have uh, negative values. And now we're going to start updating our uh, responsibility by basically, since uh, A is initially zero, the, the availability is zero, we are basically looking at uh, the, the responsibility that, is, that one point sends to the other is based on the similarity between the two of them and the similarity between that other point, the, the candidate for uh, um, uh, being a, 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 a prototype, the similarity to all other points. So we are uh, measuring uh, something like a relative similarity between the points. If we have one point that is, is similar to, uh, to another, and it's the most similar one, then it will send uh, a greater vote there. Uh, after, this, uh, after some iterations, we start to have some availability here, so uh, this is also, also gets discounted on how available the, the target point, the, the candidate is to be a representative of, those, of that point. And then we also update the availability here, which would be uh, uh, the minimum value of either zero, so zero would be the maximum of, of this, or uh, the uh, self-responsibility, or the responsibility for one point, plus the maximum of all the votes it's getting uh, from all the other points. Uh, now we can... Uh, choose at each iteration, identify the prototypes because they will be the ones that uh, have the maximum of the sum of availability and responsibility uh, to, with respect to all the points. So if one point uh, has another point that it finds to have both uh, availability, being available to represent this point, and also it, uh, uh, the vote it casts for that point to represent them. If that is higher, then this point belongs to that cluster. If the point is itself the highest value for that, so the one that is best at representing himself and most available to represent himself, then that point will be uh, a prototype for a cluster. So this is a bit abstract, but we can try to see it more visually. When we start in the beginning, we have everything at zero, so basically each point is its own cluster. But in the first iteration, we can find some some cases where points actually cast votes for the other points, so they find some other points to be better at representing them than themselves. So in this case we have a small cluster here, a small cluster here, these large circles are the prototypes, and the small dots are those that delegate the representativity to the prototype. But as we keep iterating, the, vo the votes keep coming in, the availability and responsibility keep changing, and so we start having some groups split, some uh, change their mind, and the things will vary, but we start having uh, more groups there, and we keep iterating, and we start getting larger groups. This is not monotonically, because the, sometimes the matrix is, will keep changing, and points will start voting uh, for other prototypes, so at some point we can have these large two groups, but then they split apart, and eventually the thing converges. So 
The number of clusters you get depends on that self-availability in the beginning. So the, the self-similarity, the column, the, the um, diagonal on the similarity matrix will determine how reluctant a point is to become a, a prototype and represent others. Uh, and then you, you can converge this to uh, different uh, numbers of, of clusters in the end. But you don't specify explicitly the number of clusters. So, uh, the, depending on the data, the number of clusters will arise uh, after these uh, iterations. So, this has automatic K. It's not completely dependent on similarity. You can have the, you don't need the points to belong to a cluster exactly because of the distance. But it still has this problem of being based on prototypes, so it tends to cluster points around the prototype that are similar to that prototype. So it cannot follow, for example, the contiguity of these, uh, uh, these clusters here, and it will uh, create, in this case, for example, a clustering that is not uh, really adequate for the, the, the kind of structure we have in the data. <coughs> to use affinity propagation in, in scikit learn, you have this, this class here. So basically, you have a, a maximum number of iterations. You can use this uh, affinity and uh, uh, you have the, the uh, at the end you can find the, the labels, the, the indices for those prototypes and so on. So basically you can use the, the, the implementation that, that is there in uh, scikit-learn for this. Another algorithm that uh, works um, different now, so we saw the K means we specify K, we have a prototype based clustering, with affinity propagation we don't specify the number of clusters, this will depend on the data and, and that first uh, parameter, the diagonal of the, the similarity, but we still have prototype based clusters, so we tend to have clusters around the, the prototype, and now we're going to look at a different algorithm which is uh, this one, density based spatial clustering, which is not based on prototypes. So now we don't have a single prototype dis determining uh, what the group is or representing a set of points. The idea here is that we have basically two parameters. We have a distance, uh, this uh, epsilon, which determines the neighborhood around each point. So the neighborhood around each point is that region of distance epsilon or less to the point. And we have this other parameter, which is the minimum number of other points that must be in the neighborhood of any given point for that point to be a core point. So this is uh, another parameter that we have. And basically, we need to define these two parameters, the epsilon and the minimum number of points. Now, this, uh, each point is a core point if it, if it has at least that number, minimum number of points in its epsilon neighborhood. So we can, we can count the points around uh, uh, with a distance epsilon or less, and if it's greater or equal to minimum number of points, that point is a core point. And we have this notion of reachability. We can reach from one point to the other, either if they are in the, in neighborhood, in the neighborhood of one another, or if there is some core point that is reachable from both. So we can have a, a, a sequence of core points that allows us to reach one, from one point to the other. As long as all the core points are in the neighborhood of one another, we can go through all the core points and reach from one point to the other. <coughs> now, the algorithm consists of visiting each point, counting the number of points around uh, the, in this epsilon neighborhood, around the point we are visiting, and then we have a decision. If the number of points is below the minimum number of points, we presume that this point is nice. It's not part of a cluster, uh, it, the, there is nothing there uh, in that region. Otherwise, if it has at least the minimum number of points in the neighborhood, then this point uh, is a core point for a cluster. So we create a cluster, and for each uh, point around uh, the, uh, the neighborhood, we add to that cluster. So every time we find a core point, a, a point that has at least uh, the minimum number of points in that neighborhood, we create a cluster and all the points in the neighborhood belong to the cluster. So points that might initially have been labeled as noise will no longer be noise because now they are part of the cluster. <coughs> if any of the points in the neighborhood was already a core point for some cluster, then we merge the two clusters uh, together. Uh, so that the clusters will grow uh, in the neighborhood of core points. 
and the end result is something like this. So if we apply this uh, algorithm here with the adequate parameters for the epsilon and the minimum number of points, we find these two clusters, one here, one, uh, one blue, one green. The uh, black dots there are those that are left outside, are the noise dots that do not belong to any class. Now this has no prototypes, there is no single point here that defines this cluster, but there are these uh, core points. So the core points are not actually prototypes because they do not individually determine the cluster, but these core points here, which are, which are shown uh, with, a, uh, with a white center, form the, this uh, uh, reachability network that means that one point here, this green point here, can reach that point there because there are core points in their neighborhood and then we can jump from core point to core point in all those epsilon neighborhoods from one to the other. So this is what makes them all belong to the same cluster. Uh, so this way with dbscan you can uh, create clusters by, uh, according to density regardless of their shape and you can also discard noise, everything that is in those regions with low density uh, if they are not neighbors of a core point and do not have the minimum number of points in their neighborhood then they do not belong to any cluster and they are left out as not. <coughs> so DBSCAN with scikit-learn you have this mean samples is the minimum number of points F is the epsilon the distance value for, for the neighborhood then you can use uh, different distance matrices if you, if you need. The default is Euclidean, but you can recompute uh, a matrix or provide your own uh, function for, for doing, computing the distances. And then you have the, the labels, the clusters each point belongs to, and the indices of all the points that belong to the core region. Now, another problem, we saw three uh, clustering algorithms, but it's now time we take a look at how we can validate uh, the cluster. So, uh, what makes some clustering a good cluster? By the way, the word clustering can be used in two different meanings. If it's a verb, it's the, the act of computing the cluster. If it's a noun, it's the set of all clusters that we have computed. So, we want to evaluate each clustering, each set of clusters, that we create. So in supervised learning we have these, uh, uh, these values in our training data that we can use to measure if things are going well or, or not or how well they are going. In unsupervised learning we don't have that so our definition of what is a good clustering will depend on what we want to do with those clusters. So we have different contexts, different kinds of data and also different purposes for evaluating them. For example, we w may want to determine if there is actually any structure in the data or not. So we may have to try to, to figure out some way of evaluating the data depending on what structure we are trying to find. Uh, we may want to determine the best number of clusters to uh, split our data into, evaluate how well uh, those uh, clusters fit the structure of the data, uh, or even evaluate how well they fit some external information that we may have. For example, we may want to use unsupervised learning to help pre-process our data before we do supervised learning. So we may want to look at the, the actual labels that we have for classes or things like that and see if they correlate with the clusters we are finding. We can also uh, have some tasks of, of comparing different clusterings or different sets of clusters to try to figure out which algorithm is best or something like that. So let's see some measures that we can use to validate clusters in without external information. So th these are uh, inner uh, indices for our clusters. We can look at the cohesion of the clusters, separation of the clusters, and uh, we can, if we have distances, we can use this sum of squares error. And also there is a, uh, this CWS score which balances distances within clusters and distances between clusters. So let's see the idea of cohesion. If we have some similarity matrix, which tells us how uh, similar the clusters are, we can measure the similarity of all the points, of all the pairs of points belonging to the same cluster. So basically we are, we are measuring the similarity of all the combinations of two points in, each, in one cluster and this will tell us how uh, cohesive the cluster is. If the points are very similar then we have a high coherence value. If the points are very dissimilar then we have a low coherence value. 
Of course, we can, instead of using similarity, we can use distance or distance between the points, and then the, the result, the values will be switched around, but the idea is the same. We can find out how well they are grouped together by measuring how similar they are to one another. We can also do that to, to find the separation between clusters. So if we now look at pairs from two different clusters, and we look at their similarities, we can figure out how well separated the clusters are. If the clusters are too mixed together, we will find very similar values when we take points from two clusters. If they are very spread apart, then they will all be uh, very dissimilar. So these are two intuitive measures that we can find for evaluating clusters, and they work well when we have globular clusters. If we have uh, uh, clusters based on prototypes, then we can simplify these measures by using the prototypes instead of, instead of doing all the pairs. We can compare all the points to the prototype, or we can simply compare two prototypes when we have two different clusters. So the farther apart the clusters are, the farther apart the prototypes will be, and we can use that to, to measure the, the similarity between the clusters. They can be the centroids, they can be in affinity propagation, those representatives, they can be the medoids. So, so it's uh, in all cases when the cluster is defined by one point to which the others belong. So in that case, you can use that one point as the representative of the cluster. Uh, another, uh, if we have actual distances, then we have these, for instance, this sum of square errors, which basically we can use the square distance between the points and uh, sum them. And uh, um, we can also, I whether we have distance or even, uh, we can use it with similarity, but usually we use it with distance. Uh, the silhouette score uh, can tell us uh, an idea of how well the points are grouped together relative to how well the clusters are separated. So we have these two uh, measures. A is the average distance uh, of uh, uh, one point to all points in the same cluster, so we can measure that for all the points and average uh, the distance between one point and the other points in the same cluster. And B is the same thing, but measure two points in the nearest cluster, so points with the closest average distance, but the, uh, that belong to another cluster. So basically, if we have a very large value of B, uh, meaning that uh, the distance to points in the closest cluster is very large, and the uh, uh, low value of A, because our cluster is very tightly uh, squeezed together, then uh, B minus A uh, divided by the maximum of the two will tend to 1. So a silhouette score that, go, uh, that is close to 1 means that the clusters are very tight and very far apart. If the, other, uh, the opposite happens. If they are very spread out, uh, but the points tend to be close two points in another cluster, then we can have a smaller B and a larger A, and we can have a negative silhouette score. So if the silhouette score is small or even negative, it can go down to minus one, theoretically. Uh, this means that the clusters are very uh, mixed together. You have uh, the silhouette score in the, the matrix module of, of scikit-learn. So basically, you provide the data and the labels. It uh, uh, computes the distance and gives you the silhouette score. And these are some examples of different silhouette score values. If you have these uh, well-defined type clusters that are uh, considerably spread apart, the average silhouette score for this will be uh, that uh, 0 0.7. If uh, you don't have the correct number of clusters in this case, so if you try to do this with two clusters instead of three, we lower the silhouette score because now these belong to the same cluster but they are uh, considerably further apart than they were uh, when we split into the, the three clusters. <laughs> However, the silhouette score does not work well and in general these inner metrics are not very appropriate for non-globular clusters. So if you have something like this, uh, you can have a, a bad silhouette score, regardless of whether you uh, do the, the clustering correctly or not, because then you have points that are close together between clusters and points that are spread apart within clusters, so uh, it doesn't work very well. For example, uh, also, uh, you have these problems when uh, you have different dispersions and the clusters have some frontiers that are very close together, 
the silhouette score may not represent well uh, a good clustering. For example, in this case, with the DB scan, we actually have a very good clusters defined here. Uh, we have the noise part and then all these, uh, these well-defined clusters, but the silhouette score is very low because of the shape of the clusters. There are, uh, these points are a lot further apart than points in the other clusters, so this affects the, those uh, metrics and gives us a lower silhouette score. So basically, we have uh, seen here some internal indices. These are used in unsupervised learning to try to evaluate the clusters. But it's important to note that the, the indexes you use to evaluate clusters will depend a lot on the kind of data that you have and the kind of clusters that you have. Another possibility is to use some external index, which is, uh, for example, in supervised learning, if we have information about the class of the point, we can try to correlate that with the clusters and see how well the clusters are, ref uh, are reflecting this additional information that we have. Uh, there is also another thing that we can do is to try to compare different clusterings. Usually this is done by comparing uh, the um, internal indexes between the two, for example, silhouette scores or things like that, but maybe you can try to actually measure in some cases correlation between belonging to one cluster in one case or to another cluster in another case and so on. This depends on exactly what you're trying to compare uh, when comparing the different clusters. This is a, a, a bit old, this quote from 1988, but uh, it, it appears uh, all, nearly all the time when we look for cluster validation. And uh, the idea is that uh, cluster validation of, of clustering is really the most difficult part in clustering. Uh, because, uh, and, and it's intuitive why that is, because it's not so much about the algorithm doing the computation, because you can think about different algorithms for creating clusters, but it's about what we want to group the points for, how we want to group the points. And this is not something that we can uh, immediately say in which way the points will be grouped. So in this case, in, in this uh, particular aspect, unsupervised learning is quite different from supervised learning because in supervised learning, we usually have one very well-defined metric of performance. So that, that's even part of a well-posed machine learning problem according to Mitchell's definition. But in unsupervised learning, we have to figure out what we want to do with the data. And depending on that, uh, some, the result may be good or bad, even if it's the same result. So we, we do need to have uh, some way of validating clustering, however it's a very difficult uh, task to, to do and depends a lot on what we want to do with the data. So to sum up, we saw um, some problems with prototype based clustering, which can be solved in some cases with uh, algorithms like affinity propagation. Of course, these problems of having to specify the, the exact number of clusters, for example, are problems in some cases, but are actually useful in other cases, like factor quantization. So the basic idea here is that you really need to think about how appropriate the algorithm is for the clustering task that you're doing, because uh, the clustering, the, the meaning of the clusters themselves depends on what you want to do with the data. And then we also saw some uh, density-based uh, clustering, DB scan, which does not use prototypes. So it defines those core regions and it creates the clusters based on density. This uh, does not depend on the shape of the clusters. It does depend, however, on differences in density between different parts of, of uh, our data set. We saw a bit about cluster validation, but the main idea is that although it's very important, it's also very hard to do, so we will only look a bit at it and not, not much in depth. And these are some uh, papers if you want to read for the affinity propagation and DB scan. And also, Scikit-Learn has documentation and demos on, on clustering. 